In this example, we're told that we have a rotating disc viscometer, and it, we're given that it has a certain radius and a certain clearance h. h is this distance between the rotating plate and the housing containing the fluid. The, the, all the light gray material in here is the fluid. And uh, we're told that the torque required to rotate the disc at a certain speed is given, so that there's going to be a torque that we're applying to rotate that disc. And we're asked to determine the dynamic viscosity of the fluid. So this is the way a viscometer works, is you typically have some sort of device where you rotate a surface, you measure the torque required to rotate that surface, and you can back out what the viscosity of the fluid is. We're told we can neglect viscous forces on the rim of the disc and the vertical shaft, so that means these little bits here, so we'll neglect those. And then part B of the problem is an uncertainty analysis. Okay, so let's get started on this. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the reason we have to apply some torque to rotate this is because the fluid in here doesn't really want to move. That Because of the no-slip boundary condition at the housing, the fluid wants to have zero velocity, but obviously the disc here is rotating, so it wants to drag the fluid along with it, and so we're going to get a viscous force that's opposing the motion of the disc, and then that viscous force gets translated into a torque because it's rotating. So we need to figure out what that that little bit of torque, or we need to figure out what that torque is that the fluid is exerting on the disc in order to resist the movement. So to do that, let me draw a picture of the disc looking from below. So it's a circular disc. Uh, we're told that the radius is capital R. And it's rotating around, and uh, I'll just draw it rotating this way. There's capital omega. And so if I go out at some particular radius here, let me just go out to some arbitrary radius, little r. Along that circle, that'll all have the same velocity. Right? And in fact, instead of a circle, let me make just a very thin area. As thin as you ever want to make it. So that's a little annulus. It's very thin so that its thickness is dr. So in that little area, and by the way, let me, let me draw that. Uh, what that area is. The area of that little annulus will be the circumference, 2 pi r, times its thickness, dr. You can prove this to yourself by, you can, by taking the area of the outer circle, subtract the area of the inner circle, the radii will be different by a dr, and then take the limit as dr gets very, very small, and it'll come out to be the circumference times the thickness. So over that little area, the velocity is a constant. In fact, if I sketched out the velocity would be omega times little r. That just comes from kinematics. And that's the same little, same velocity over that whole surface, or that whole little area. Right? So if that velocity is the same, and then of course the velocity on the housing up here is zero, I'll always get the same velocity gradient between the disk and the housing over that little area. And that's important because that velocity gradient will be related to the viscous stress acting on the disc. And then from that viscous stress, we can find the moment that we need to apply to rotate the, the whole thing. So I'm going to do these. I'm going to figure this out in terms of. Um, actually, you know what? Let me write down the the little bit of torque that we have to apply to the disc in order to rotate it because of the viscous stress acting on that little bit of area. So the little bit of torque will be an R cross F kind of calculation. So the radius out to that little area is just R, little r. And then the force that that viscous stress is exerting on that little area will be this viscous stress times the area over which it acts, dA. So this is like our R cross F calculation. And the area we just said was 2 pi R dr. OK, so what we need to find now is what the viscous stress is acting on that little area. The viscous stress, of course, will be, assuming it's a Newtonian fluid, it'll be a mu times the velocity gradient. Specifically, it's how the the circumferential velocity, which I'll call du theta, how that changes with respect to y. y is like this distance headed upward like that. 
So that's that viscous stress. Now, if, <clears throat> in the if you look at the velocity profile between the disc and the fluid, and this is very hard for me to draw, but if looking edge on, the velocity on the housing is going to be zero, so it's zero velocity here. And that's because, and I, this is not on the shaft. I, since we're looking at it from the side, this, I'm trying to do this on the housing part. It's kind of like the, the velocity. Uh, let me see if I can sketch this better in th uh, kind of a perspective drawing. What I'm trying to do is get the velocity at some radius r here. And then the velocity on the housing right above that radius r is 0. Right, at, at y is equal to h. And then the velocity on the disk at that point right here we said was omega r, omega little r. And the velocity profile will be linear there. We're going to assume that it's a linear velocity profile because it's a narrow gap and we'll assume that it's a, like a couette style velocity profile. It's just the movement of the boundary that's causing the fluid to rotate. Now in reality it's pretty close to being a couette velocity profile because it's a small gap. It might have a little curvature to it, but for an engineering approximation, this is actually pretty good. So to find that velocity gradient, all I'm going to do is just simply just look at the change in the, the velocity over the change in position. The change in the velocity will just be omega r because it's going from omega r to zero. And the change in the height over, or the change in the y position is just h. Okay, so that's our velocity gradient. The velocity gradient in this case is a constant. It's just the same velocity gradient over the whole thing. And the reason for that is because this is a straight line. If we add some curvature to it, we'd actually have to write out the equation for u theta and then take the derivative and evaluate it specifically when y is equal to zero. But since we're assuming a Couette velocity profile, which has a straight line kind of profile, it's just, it's very simple to find the gradient. It's just the change in the velocity, du theta, over the change in the height, dy. I'm not worried about this, you know, getting all the signs correct here. I just know that this will be a resistance torque. So I, I, I know that we have to overcome that torque. If you want, you could be a little more careful and write out all the signs and, and get it all worked out. Now the other thing that we need to do is keep in mind that this is the little bit of torque acting on one side of the disk. So I've just drawn this perhaps like looking from the bottom. But remember there's a top side as well, so I need to multiply that torque by 2 to take into account the top and bottom. Okay, so that's where that 2 comes from, is from the top and the bottom. So that's the torque due to this one little ring. But I need to make sure to get the whole torque, so I'm going to have to do all kinds, you know, all, all of the rings here. So I'm going to integrate that little bit of torque to get the total torque as the radius goes from zero out to capital R. So as we go from the center of the disk all the way to the outer part. Okay, so we're going to add up all those little torques, and we can pull some constants out here. So we'll pull out 4 pi mu omega over h. And then we're left with the integral of, let me just get, there's 1, 2, integral of r cubed, which will be a 1 fourth r to the fourth. Okay, so you'll see that the 4's cancel out. And since, since we're trying to solve for the viscosity, let me rearrange that equation to explicitly solve for the viscosity. So we'll have the torque that we measure times the gap height h divided by, there's a pi, there's an omega, and an r to the fourth. So if we measure the torque, and we know the geometry of the device, so we know the h and the r, and we know how fast we're spinning it, we should be able to back out what the viscosity is for this assumed Newtonian fluid. Okay, so let me just recap how we calculated this. We realized that this disk um, will have 
the velocity gradient will change as you change radius because the velocity at each little ring here is different because the velocity is omega times little r and the little r will change. So because that velocity, cha velocity gradient changes, that means the shear stress will change. Okay, And to get the torque caused by the stresses on that ring, it's the an r cross f calculation. So the r, it's the moment arm. The force will be the shear stress times the little bit of area. The little bit of area is just the area of that ring, which is 2 pi r dr. To get the shear stress, it's the viscosity times the velocity gradient. To get the velocity gradient, we assumed a coet flow profile, which has a, a straight line profile. So the, the slope of that will just be the change in the velocity divided by the change in position. And it's just a constant because it's a straight line. And then that was the torque caused by the viscous stresses on that little ring. To get the total torque, we integrated them as the radius goes from zero to capital R. Then we just rearrange to get this. And if you plug in the numbers that are given, and I, I won't rewrite the numbers, but if you plug in the numbers for this, you'll get mu is equal to 0 0.29 um, Pascal seconds. OK. Now the second part of this problem is to do an uncertainty analysis. We're told that the relative uncertainty in each parameter is 1%, determine the uncertainty in the viscosity. So what that means is we're going to try to find the absolute uncertainty in the viscosity. Um, actually, we'll do it in terms of relative uh, uncertainty since we're given relative uncertainty. So the relative uncertainty in the viscosity will be the relative uncertainty in the viscosity due to the uncertainty in the torque squared relative uncertainty in the viscosity due to the uncertainty in the height squared. And we do this for each of the parameters. Oops. OK, so there's each of the parameters. And to, we'll continue on to find the relative uncertainty in the viscosity due to the uncertainty in the torque. That will look like this, just 1 over mu times d mu dt times the absolute uncertainty in the torque. So if I substitute in here, hopefully all of this looks familiar to you. You hopefully have done some of these problems before, so it's not uh, doesn't look surprising to you. OK, so here's the 1 over mu. I just substituted this in. Here's d mu dt is this term. And there's our absolute uncertainty in the torque. So you'll see the h pi omega r to the fourth, those all cancel out. And what we're left with is just dt over t, or the relative uncertainty in the torque. OK, and we can do the same thing for the other parameters. So I'm not going to do all of them. Um, you, you can get the general idea, but what you'll get is the relative uncertainty in the viscosity due to the uncertainty in the height comes out to be just the relative uncertainty in the height. When you do the, uh, the relative uncertainty in mu due to omega, that will come out to be minus relative uncertainty in omega. It's minus because it, it's in the denominator here, so you get when you do the derivative, you'll get a negative. And then when you do the radius, this one's the only one that looks different. That will end up being minus 4 times the relative uncertainty in the radius, like that. And the minus 4, again, comes from uh, when you take when you do the derivative, you have a radius to the fourth in the, de in the denominator. So you'll get a minus 4 that appears. So we can plug these values back in. So this would be like ut squared plus uh squared plus u omega squared. The, the minus sign doesn't matter because we're squaring it. And then you'll get 16 times u sub r squared. So first of all, one of the things you see right away is that if you're going to try and improve this experiment in some way, where you really should be focusing your efforts is trying to get the relative uncertainty in the radius 
as small as possible because it's multiplied by a factor of 16. So that, that has a really big contribution. But we were told in the problem statement that the relative uncertainty in all of these was just 1%. Right. So that was just given in the problem statement. So then you can calculate that the relative uncertainty of mu comes out to be 4.4%. Or, or I should just probably leave it as a decimal, 0 0.044. <clears throat> and then from that, you can go ahead and calculate what the absolute uncertainty is. Remember that the relative uncertainty is just the absolute uncertainty divided by the actual value. So when we work this all out, the viscosity will be 0.29 pascal seconds plus or minus when you when you multiply 0 0.044 times the 0.29, it'll come out to be 0 0.01. Okay, so hopefully the uncertainty analysis is no big surprise. You, I'm sure you've done these before, so you should know how to be able to propagate experimental uncertainty. Okay, we'll go ahead and end the example there.